you will see something different now because my laboratory is a more, a, a more technological laboratory, not too much focused on specific topics, proteins, or systems. But we do develop bioactive compounds, bioactive molecules, which are peptides. You will see something on peptides today. But we also develop monoclonal, antibo monoclonal antibodies, actually fragments of monoclonal antibodies, single chains, recombinant fabs, against specific targets, which are the same we will see in one of the slides today and also others we are studying since many, many years. So uh, this is an outline of the presentation. I will uh, spend some few slides at the beginning to introduce a little bit what PEPTA libraries are, because I've seen today and yesterday that, or at least in the laboratory of, uh, of um, Mauro, that you are not too much involved in the synthetic chemistry, but you are probably more uh, biologist or something like this. So I hope to give you an idea of what we do with the, si with the synthesis and the screening of these peptides. Then I will uh, show you a couple of slides to uh, see how we choose strategically the libraries or the targets or old approaches, new approaches to identify the, 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 the bioactive peptides. And I also will show you a couple of case studies. One is uh, the very old study Sandra's already mentioned before, published in 2000 on nature biotechnologies, but biotechnology on this peptide that binds the FC portion of uh, antibodies. And then another very interesting study we have uh, published two years ago on a peptide which is now in a phase in clinical trial phase one, two for multiple myeloma. It's a very, very interesting story. So uh, what are peptide libraries? This is a general uh, uh, definition, mixture, rational mixture of synthetic peptides, which are prepared, generated by synthetic combinatorial methods. I will not go into details on this. And containing for a given sequence, all the combination, uh, sequence and sequence length, all the possible co uh, combinations of, uh, of amino acids. So. For example, if we choose to prepare, to generate a screening library of uh, tripeptides, which is the, uh, so, a library of tripeptides with all the available 20 different amino acids, we can generate 8,000 different tripeptides by simply applying this, this, uh, this formula here, and so on. So we can go from very simple libraries of some 6,000 uh, different tripeptides to millions of peptides by simply increasing the uh, number of amino acids or the length of the peptide. It's a very simple to be calculated. For what we use them? We use them, as I said, we are a drug discovery laboratory, so we use them to find out inhibitors of protein-protein interaction, which is one we are mostly focused on protein-protein interactions to identify enzyme inhibitors, new antigen, sorry, new antigens and whatever. The applications are here, therapeutic applications, diagnostics and whatever. So the advantages of using the synthetic peptide libraries is uh, essentially those associated to single peptides because at the end of the story you will have, you will get a peptide. These peptides have are advantages and drawbacks. The advantages are that can, they can be very easily prepared. The cost is quite generally is cheap, very well robust chemistry. So you can prepare very rapidly. Short peptides can be prepared in a, in few hours or less than one hour. We prepare three tetra penta peptides in less than 30 minutes now in our laboratory. And, this is the, and the same is for, for, for the, the mitral peptides. It's the, exactly the same time. Uh, another very interesting uh, advantage is that they have a built-in code for the, the immediate convolution, for example, by microsequencing or mass spec methods. So drawbacks, you can imagine, they are flexible molecules, low, relatively low chemical diversity. 
by preparing this huge libraries, the idea is that we have a, a large repertoire of molecules where we pick up the bioactive one. So the idea should be that they have to be as, as, uh, as different as possible. But the point is that peptides are not very, very different because the backbone in the middle is always the same. We just change the side chains. We just play with the side chains of the peptide. We do not work with the, we, do, we do not change the, 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 the backbone. Can be changed. In some cases, we have changed also the backbone. But typically, with classical peptide libraries, we only work with the side, we only play with the side chains. And so on. But so, reasoning on advantages and drawbacks we have used in our uh, projects modified peptides, like, for example, cyclic, branched, some with amide bond surrogates, and, and so on. So, one slide only to show you how peptides are prepared, just for those who are not uh, in this field. Uh, th this they are prepared by the solid phase method very, very rapidly. As said, a tripeptide in my laboratory, a, a, a student can prepare a tripeptide in 30 minutes. After 30 minutes, you will get in your hand a powder, a white powder, which is your peptide. Not purified, but typically a tripeptide as, is more than 95 or more pure, 95 or 97. This seems to be a detail. But it's not a detail. This is very important because for those, those people who work with small molecules, they very often draw, they sketch molecule on the, on, on, on a, on, on the paper. But this will not always translate into a real molecule. This could be sometimes impossible to get the, the, the molecule. But with the peptide, you will always get the, tri the, the peptides because it is very, very simple. And another important thing we have to learn from this scheme here that peptides are synthesized on a solid phase attaching the C-terminus and then we arrive at the N-terminus. So this is the, the, the direction of the synthesis. This is important for me for the next slides to show you how we deconvolute them. How we prepare mixtures of peptides. This is a very simple scheme, and this is the most common uh, method to prepare mixtures. This is called mix split. I will also not go into details, but using this, uh, these beads we use for the synthesis, we, what we do is that at each step where we couple a mixture, or uh, sorry, a, 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 an amino acid, we do a mix and split procedure. So it means that by this simple game, at every step, we will increase exponentially the number of peptides we generate. So, for example, in the three simple steps, which are the same steps we use for the preparation of a single peptide, we can generate, for example, as in this case, 27 tripeptides. Using more amino acids or longer sequences, we can generate hundreds or thousands or millions of peptides. What is important to remember that by this simple game or something others like this one, we will have, for example, pools, rational pools of peptides, like, for example, in this example here, where we have nine different tripeptides and nine different tripeptides here, nine different tripeptides here, but the pool here contains on the end terminus the same rate the same residue. There's a lysine here, there's a proline here, there's a phenylalanine here. So this means that the pool is labeled by the N-terminal residue. So this helps us for the deconvolution of the library because using assays, we, I will show some, some of this, we can deconvolute the library. We use these pools like single molecules and we, can, uh, we screw them. Competition assay, binding assay, whatever fluorescent uh, assays, uh, fluorescent polarization, whatever. So we use the, all, all the pools, all the separate pools in, in, in parallel assays. In this case, this is a simple case with the, a tripeptide, li tripeptide library made with 20 different natural amino acids. So we have 20 different pools. Every pool contains 400 different uh, uh, tripeptides. 
So we identify the best one, then this pool here with 400 molecules is split in a new, in sub pools, each one contains 20 and so on, until we reach one single peptide for in, in, in sample, we have read the sequence of the active peptide. This is a very simple scheme, but can be, of course, translated to more complicated ones. The assays, as said, can be whatever you can imagine, you can, whatever you can, uh, it's just a matter of fantasy or technological uh, ability, expertise, and uh, resource in your lab. For example, very classical, simple ELISA assays for protein-prone interaction can be used to identify inhibitors. Or, for example, FRET, FLOC, any kind of fluorescence, as I said. Uh, then uh, we can use SPR, for example, Biacor or similar uh, uh, label-free techniques, and so on. This is just a, a, a slide to uh, that summarizes some, not all, of the projects we have uh, run using this approach or similar approaches. This is the one, this is FC gamma, there's something wrong here. FC gamma receptor this is the first one and the one that Sandra's already cited. Um, I will show you uh, some slides on this example here. This is the second one. We also see something about this one. Then we made a, a project with Sandro to identify inhibitors of the PLGF felt one interaction. And we identify the peptide we are now still working with with Sandro, which is a very potent, uh, although it is not, has not a, it's not a high, highly potent against the receptor. It is a very potent anti-angiogenic molecule and anti-tumor uh, anti molecule. Then we have identified in the past also uh, inhibitors for the crypto ARC4 interaction, for PED, PLD1, and so on. We have also worked a lot with the IgE, uh, I affinity receptor, and, and so on. We are now just submitted a paper using the same approach, the same technology to identify antioxidant peptides. We have identified it's very short, very nice, and very well. Uh, structured peptides uh, are, that are banned and contain a trifluoracetyl group on the end terminus. Without the trifluoracetyl group, they lose the antioxidant activity. If we change some of the rest, we lose the antioxidant activity. Uh, very, very interesting. And many others. These are the typical assay we use for identifying the protein protein interaction inhibitors. This is a classical binding assay in ELISA. These are the, the targets we have used in the past. Crypto, PED, PLD1, GAD45 beta, and as you will see, the uh, KDs, or the IC50, we have, uh, uh, ident we have uh, uh, identified in, the, in, this, in this, uh, this approach with the different targets, range from the high nanomolar sub-nanomolar to micromolar. So we have all range of uh, possibilities. So uh, this is a, the old approach we used with the peptide libraries. We, were, uh, we used large mixture libraries, long peptides. Then we moved to large libraries with a lot of different uh, amino acids uh, with short randomized sequences to reduce the, the screening time. Then we, we also used uh, large molecules, multimerized, um, um, in order to increase the surface. Because in some specific cases, for example, the PLGF felt one project, we couldn't get any active molecule with, the sh with short, small peptides. So we increase the surface and we obtain at the end very, very interesting ligands. And also we have published some papers on cyclic peptides. Uh, these are the same projects as before, uh, ranked by the different uh, type of, of, uh, of libraries. Well, some years ago, we also introduced the concept of SMART, or Simplified Synthetic Libraries, just to simplify the process. Because instead of using 
20 or 30 or 40 different amino acids, we uh, selected just some of them because, for example, in the 20 different amino acids, some of them have redundant uh, properties. Just to cite, glutamic acid and aspartic acid are ve have very similar properties. They have glutamic acid is just a little bit longer than the other one. So we choose a reduced set of, uh, of uh, amino acids that uh, uh, took into account more or less all the properties, chemi physical chemical properties of, of the race. We have used, we are using this one in the last, in the last, uh, in the last works. We also, very recently, we have just started the collaboration with uh, Gabriele Cruciani in uh, Perugia and Simon Cross, uh, which they, they work, he's a professor at, professor at the University of Perugia, but they are, they are also um, the owner and, uh, and uh, employees of Molecular Discovery, which is a, a software house that develops um, softwares for uh, molecular docking, for uh, any kind of uh, um, problems associated to proteins or other kind of molecules to identify bioactive molecules or things like that. They have developed a new software. We have worked together on this project um, to... Uh, this software is called, it is not written, it's called FlapDoc, the software uses new, a new algorithm to identify protein cavities. These cavities on proteins are described not as, a, I, I don't know how, uh, who is uh, uh, in the field of, uh, of proteins, but, the, but in this software, the cavities are not seen, or atoms are not seen as, as points but they are seen as surfaces. So it is a different concept in respect to the old one. Anyway, uh, just to make the story short, the software designs, identifies the pockets on the proteins. We, sh we choose the proteins. The, the, pro the software uh, identifies these pockets uh, on the proteins and also is able to design very short peptides that should fit into this pocket. Tripeptides or tetrapeptides very, very short, and in the deconfiguration. And then we, in this case, it gives us only small sets. For example, for one cavity, it gives us back 24 different type 3 peptides or tetrapeptides. In this case, we can synthesize that by, as a single molecules, very rapidly. In uh, one, two weeks, we can synthesize and also test them very, very rapidly using the recombinant proteins by label-free or the acids we have seen before. And I have some data on, on, uh, on some proteins, but it is uh, at the end. If you have time, we can see something. And now I will move to some of the, two, some of, uh, the case studies we have uh, um, published in these years. The first one is the, is the is the project that started some 20 years ago when we were in the company uh, Mauro was mentioning before. And at that time, we were working a lot with monoclonal antibodies. The company was producing grams of uh, anti-TNF-alpha monoclonal antibodies. And one of the problems we had was the purification of the, of the, the, the maps from the supernatants. Because as you know, because we, many of you use it, uh, Typically, protein A is used for the purific affinity purification for the first step of uh, uh, antibody purification. And what we wanted to have was a, a synthetic mimic of protein A or something that could make the same job as protein A but of synthetic origin for, for some different reasons. So what we did at that time was to design a library. This is a very old slide, I'm sorry. But anyway, this is a multimeric library with, of tripeptides with made by 20 different residues uh, and built by the portioning, mixing method that we have seen before. And this, the assay, look, this is, the, this is the, the first paper appeared on this, uh, on this project. The assay was very, very simple. We coded the analyzer plate with protein A. We bioterminated an IgG1, a monoclonal IgG1, 
and we used the library to inhibit this interaction. So the interaction, as you certainly know, between antibody and protein A is on the C, C gamma 2, C gamma 3 of the, the antibodies, see, on a very specific site. So the molecule should um, reasonably bind on the same site, or they could bind probably protein A, because when you run an, a, a, an inhibition experiment this way, you, you don't know if the peptide do bind here or do bind here. But anyway, we made the screening. Yeah, this is a slide on the synthesis. We made the screening uh, using the library, and we identified on the N-terminus and arginine, then on second position, threonine, then uh, uh, tyrosine. We characterized this molecule we called uh, protein A mimetic or TG, like technogen. This is the number of the notebook where it was for the first time annotated. Uh, and this molecule here, so we, we uh, confirm that the peptide bound only to antibodies, not to protein A. And we used, at the beginning, the peptide as an affinity ligand. We just had mobilized the peptide on cephalos. We prepared columns. And we made the many different experiments with uh, IgM, IgG, and any other kind of uh, uh, antibodies we had in the laboratory at that time. And we observed that the peptide, this is a typical affinity chromatography uh, uh, chromatograms. We, what we did, we injected, we injected the supernatants of antibodies on these columns. And we collected the purified antibodies mm -hmm. here after changing the pH. Or, uh, they were very, very pure. This is what we injected on, on the columns. This is what we recovered after purification. One single cell purification with the peptide immobilized on the resin. This is an IgM. We have published probably some 20 papers on the affinity uh, applications of this ligand. And at that time, we also commercialized the, um, the peptide with this trade name, Captive. Uh, there were some slightly different ligands for the different types of immunoglobulins. And then uh, they are, I think they are still uh, commercially available, but I don't know who is, who is producing these uh, this peptides uh, now. Then we moved, since the peptide was an inhibitor of the, F, the of bound the antibody on the specific site, which is the same site where the, anti, the FC gamma receptor bind, we identified a mole. A, in, in, a, in an experimental uh, animal model to test the peptide in vivo. So this was probably 1997, 98, Sandra. I do not remember well. But the paper was published in 2000, so it was probably one, two years before. And we identified uh, an animal model for lupus erythematosus uh, uh, as a suitable experimental model for testing this peptide. The model uh, was, uh, was is, is a very good model for lupus erythematosus. This is a strain, which is this is a um, genetically modified mouse that uh, after birth develops all the symptoms of uh, the main symptoms of uh, lupus erythematosus. For example, after t uh, 20 weeks, it th they they show a lot of immune complexes. Uh, they they develop many, many autoantibodies and proteinuria, which are the typical clinical signs for, of uh, uh, lupus of less uh, patients. Uh, this, is what, this is the experiment, just some of the experiments we did with the peptide. For example, we uh, measured the proteinuria in this, in this mice, and we saw that uh, mice treated with the, the PAM had the lower levels of uh, proteinuria, compared to the control. This is uh, two different levels of proteinuria. And also, uh, I have not shown uh, before, but the, the, this, the, this mice die at week 40, probably, around week 40. And so at, at age, at, at, after 30 weeks, after 30 weeks, 
the, the control mice were more than 90%, more than 90% of the control mice uh, died, the other one instead survived. This is the uh, D version of the molecule, the L version of the molecule. And this simply, this lower efficacy of the L version of the molecule simply <coughs> reflects the lower stability because it, was le it is clearly less stable than the other one. Uh, this slide just to show that a couple, some years ago, in two, uh, 2009, uh, a group in uh, here, close to here, uh, published the structure of the PAM complex to the FC gamma, sorry, to the FC portion of the uh, septin, and they found that the peptide bound exactly where we predicted to bind at that time with the. So another story, uh, I will be also um, very, very fast on this, uh, is um, the one regarding the identification of GAD45 beta MKK7 antagonists. GAD45 beta is uh, one of the three proteins of the GAD family. Uh, there, are, there is the alpha, the beta, and the gamma variant. The beta one is the only one that has strong and anti apoptotic properties. It has important roles in inflammation, uh, in, in oncogenesis, uh, and in chemoresistance. This is a, a molecule that is induced, that is, uh, whose expression is controlled by NF, NF kappa B. And by many papers, especially the first, oh, sorry, there's, uh, there's a paper, Nature 2001, by the group of uh, Guido Franzoso who for the first time indicated GAD for these specific properties. Uh, he described for the first time these specific properties for GAD 45 beta. And then the other, uh, another paper in 2004 where he identified the mechanism, how the protein worked. And uh, the, in this slide here is summarized how the protein works. For example, in, in cells treated which uh, receive a cell debt uh, stimulus, like for example uh, TNF alpha, what happens is that th these cells, after 20, half an hour, 20 minutes, half an hour, they, at, at the beginning they die, then they respond to the, the stimulus of, uh, of uh, TNF alpha, and the mechanism he identified was a mechanism mediated by GATI 45 beta that he identified as a, a, a sort of endogenous inhibitor of this kinase kinase called MKK7, which is an upstream activator or junk, one of the most important uh, pro-apoptotic molecule known. So uh, the, the, uh, the story was that GAD45 beta has a strong anti-apoptotic activity in response to TNF alpha or other similar insults in uh, uh, apoptosis. Uh, so we can see this, uh, but this is not important, we can skip this. But what we did at that time, <coughs> we went in contact with Guido because he was interested in uh, having actually the structure of GAD45 beta. But we had in our laboratory the recombinant protein, we also prepared the recombinant kinase. And we started screening on this system using a very simple library of tripeptides, and with this residues here, we have seen before in the simplified format. And we did the screening. In this case, this is the number we, the theoretical number we used. Uh, so it doesn't work. Um, so we did the screening on this uh, tetrapeptide library with the 12 residues, and we arrived at one, two uh, tetrapeptides that we called, uh, uh, I do not remember the, the name of the original peptide. Anyway, these were the two peptides we identified by the screen. And as you can see, the IC50 for inhibiting the interaction between these two proteins was in the sub nonomolar range, a very, very strong uh, activity. Uh, what we did, we tested this molecule uh, as a, 
inhibitors also in cells or cell extracts of the interaction between the, the two proteins. There's a very simple assay where we, we put the peptide into the cell extracts and we made some uh, uh, immunoprecipitation. And we indeed verified that at nanomolar concentration, the peptide completely abolished the binding between the two proteins. We also verified that uh, the peptides disrupted the interactions. And since the system is that M the GAT45 beta binds to MKK7 and blocks the kinase activity. So when the kinase activity is blocked, the junk activity is lost. So the, 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 uh, uh, the, the cells survive. So this means that when we treat the, the complex or the cells, where there is this interaction with an inhibitor like our, uh, our tetrapeptides, we should restore the activity of, of MKK7. And indeed, the peptides were able to restore. This is the, G, the junk uh, activation. This is the, the, the junk activation. And when we treated the cells with the peptide, the, the junk, junk was reactivated because we displaced the GAD from MKK7. MKK7 was again able to activate junk, and junk was reactivated. This is, these are peptides. These are negative controls. Peptides just a little bit change in the sequences. And this is uh, the untreated, uh, the untreated uh, uh, sample where GAD was, was, uh, was, uh, was added. So in that case, when GAD is present and peptides are not present, the, the, the uh, junk is not activated. And also, we ver verified that the peptides were not affecting the kinase activity, of course, because if the peptide went into the kinase, into the kinase pocket, they would have the same effect as GAD. Anyway, just to make the story short, we identified these tetrapeptides. We made a very long uh, process of optimization from the two tetrapeptides to a very simple tripeptide, D tripeptides which we call BTP3, we uh, confirmed that the peptide bound to MKK7, not to GAD, and it did not inhibit the kinase activity. And then uh, in the laboratory of Guido in London, uh, they made them work for five years on this project. They uh, discovered that the peptide, that sorry, that first of all, GAD was uh, uh, selectively expressed in multiple myeloma cells. So this, and treating multiple myeloma cells with the peptide, the peptide was able to selectively kill the multiple myeloma cells. And in this slide here, there are some 20, 30 cell lines. These are the, the multiple myeloma cell lines. The high, we see here that the highest the content of GAD, the lower is the IC50 on cells of the peptides meaning that the peptide only works when, when GAD is inserted into the cells. Uh, anyway, for all the details on this project, I invite you to read this paper, which is some 90 pages long, <laughs> with a lot of uh, exp yeah, supplementary, of course, but there are uh, tens of uh, different experiments to show the specificity with the uh, any kind of uh, cell with any kind of uh, SH to silence MKK7 to, si to silence GAD and so on. We published the paper in 2014, but the patent was uh, filed in 2011, so four years, four years uh, uh, earlier. And before we published the paper, we had a complete set of the MPK data on the peptide with a toxicity pharmacokinetic m made by company in UK. We also have uh, very had, we have published this, this data here, very nice p uh, data in vivo for uh, a tumor suppression. This is a very interesting um, experiment showing, this is a comparison with bortezomib. Bortezomib is the one of the two uh, compounds which is active, which is used uh, in the clinic for the treatment of multiple myeloma. And as you can see here, this is 
sorry, this DTP3 is this one. This is on, uh, on normal cells, on healthy cells. We see that the peptide is not toxic on, on normal cells, while bortezomib is, is toxic. And, and it is indeed a very toxic molecule. And they have more or less the same efficacy on multiple myeloma cells. So just to make the story short, I just want to show you the story of this molecule. We started in 2008, 2008 with an exploratory project in my laboratory using this small library of peptides. We then uh, <coughs> uh, started the collaboration with Guido Franzoso in London, and my uh, PhD student went there. She's still there. <laughs> She's still working there with the, in the laboratory of Guido. And then with some different grants, we were able to have all the toxicity and uh, pharmacokinetic data on this molecule. In 2011, when we filed the, the patent uh, Innovation, which is a company that manages all the IP of Imperial College, decided to found uh, a, a startup company, which is called Kisios Therapeutics, with the seed capital of, uh, I do not remember, probably half a million uh, pounds. Then in 2013, with, a grant, with an MRC grant, we started the first clinical trial on DTP3 for multiple myeloma treatment. This is the amounts that have been prepared to, to make the, the study. And uh, last year, Cassius, which has now 10 employees, uh, has raised 19 million pounds for making the USA trial for multiple myeloma with this molecule here, and also to make backup molecules for the TP3 because they uh, envisage that it could be toxic somewhere at a certain point, and they want to have backup molecules. So. These are the conclusion of the story about the peptides. You can read by yourself. They are very, very simple and short. And if you want, if you have um, questions regarding the technology and or the two studies, please. Step. I don't have the, the, the to thank. I, I should thank so many people for all the projects. So I don't have a slide for that. <laughs>